Many people think of atonal music as the opposite of tonal music. But what exactly does this mean? First of all, as Schoenberg himself pointed out, atonal describes something that isn't there. I don't think most people enjoy music for what it doesn't do. The word tonal, in its most conventional usage, refers to music with a certain kind of harmonic direction, where we feel like the music is indeed headed toward a particular center. This lets us develop expectations, which the composer may or may not fulfill. However, the pleasure we have from music, and in from any art form that takes place in time, studied with patterns that evolve in a perceptible direction. This gets our mind involved, and then the composer can use that to create more surprise, to resolve as expected and then move on, or to surprise us with something even better than what we expected. Our musical character itself doesn't depend only on harmonic expectations. It's also the result of patterns of tempo, register, articulation, orchestration, and so on. The development of a given musical character benefits from them, since they help to keep us involved over time. Just as, in a novel, the initial characters that the writer presents need to evolve in some coherent way for the story to make sense, in music, the idea of coherence also has a kind of narrative significance. I don't mean that all music is program music with an explicit story, but rather that we tend not to stay interested in a series of events that just seem random. So, for a series of musical events to seem coherent, you must first present some kind of perceptible pattern or patterns, develop that pattern, or those patterns, in ways that don't just seem arbitrary. This is why, in my composition book, I have a chapter called Progressing. I'm not referring here to just to conventional harmonic progressions, but, in a larger sense, to how we can notice some kind of perceptible direction. This can be in any musical parameter, not just harmony. Simple examples might include things like a crescendo, a rising line, gradually thickening or thinning orchestration, rhythms that speed up or slow down, and so forth. And in real music, these progressions are often combined. For example, combining progressively more dissonant harmony with a crescendo makes the increase of tension more potent and the music more expressive. These combinations of musical dimensions can also help the composer create many degrees of tension. Over a longer piece, there are often varying waves of intensity, not just one simple rise and fall. But for this lesson, I want to focus on the question of tonality, specifically various degrees of tonality. Let's do some experiments. Here's a musical example. Is this tonal? Well, the chords are all consonant and all the notes belong to the C major scale, but it doesn't start and end on the same chord and there's no strong feeling of harmonic direction. If I stop two bars before the end, could you really anticipate the final chord? Here's the same example, only the last chord is different. So it sounds more or less tonal than the preceding example. In neither of these completely consonant examples do we clearly sense, in advance, what's coming at the end. So our first conclusion is clear. Consonance alone doesn't create a sense of tonal direction. Okay, another example. Does this seem tonal? There's a lot more dissonant harmony here, but the ending somehow seems more inevitable. Why? Well, for one thing, the last three and a half bars are clearly limited to pitches in A minor. Also, the stepwise rising bass in these bars culminates on E, the dominant of A minor, then is an octave leap down before the last chord. Even at the start, although the dominant seventh of A minor is not resolved as expected, the bass moves stepwise up to A in measure two, and down to F in measure three, and then leaps up to B flat, the highest bass note yet. Then, when the bass comes back up for those last few bars, the rising scale continues. In other words, although the overall direction of the bass line isn't simplistic, there is a clear rise. And then, when it peaks on the dominant, there's a sense of fulfilling a linear progression. The soprano also makes a clear wave, first going up to the F and then going down to the final cadence. Although we can't say at the start what the tonic is, it gets clearer as we approach the end of the phrase. And along the way, these other progressions in the outer parts create expectations that involve the listener. Here's a variation of the same phrase.
This is even more dissonant, but again, the clear direction in the outer parts and the pitch limitations in the last few bars, only notes in A minor, still make the end feel more final. This points to an important aspect of tonality, in the sense that most people perceive it. It does not require the whole piece to be centered on one key, but just that there is a clear sense of direction and resolution, especially at the end. Another example. Here, despite the more or less random clusters in the right hand, the rising C major scale in the left hand creates a clear direction. If I make the left hand octaves more random, with no clear pattern, listen to what happens. Now there really is no perceptible harmonic or melodic direction. But we can see here that even with random clusters, the clear direction in the bass line can create expectations about where we're going. So, in themselves, Pitch limitations to a specific group of notes and consonants or dissonance don't make the music more or less tonal. This is because neither of these dimensions in themselves creates a clear sense of progression that hints at where the music is going. Now let's try another experiment. If we compare these two examples, the first one seems more or less random. However, the second one does have a perceptible direction, even though it uses exactly the same series of pitches. All I've changed in the second example is the octave positions. I've arranged them here so that the overall line rises in waves. It's not a simple scale, but each peak is higher than the one before. E, B, C. So prominent lines, especially the outer parts, and register can be used to create harmonic direction. Now let's look at another important dimension. This example contains only dissonant chords. The second version contains exactly the same notes in the chords, but with much wider spacing. The voice leading is always leaping. Which of these two sounds more random? Auditory Scene Analysis by Albert Bregman is an important book about auto perception. One of the main points he brings up is that when sounds occur in similar registers, we're more likely to hear them as part of the same line. This is why it's much harder to make sense of the second example. You hear it as too many different registers to make sense of. Now let's look at another harmonic problem. The first example by itself is coherent. The chords all contain fourths, and the cadence stands up because of the F-sharp, a small change, but along with the longer duration, it's appropriate because it arrives at an important moment in the phrase. The second version is similar, but there's one chord that stands out, the cluster at the start of measure three. It sounds like a mistake. Since all the other chords include fourths and sound rather open, this one sticks out. And further, it doesn't arrive at a significant moment, like a climax or a cadence. Could we make it sound more reasonable? Here's a possible way to achieve that. Here the chords progressively become more and more dissonant, containing more seconds and sevenths. There is more and more close chromaticism. The crescendo also increases tension. So when the cluster chord arrives, it's prepared and sounds logical, not random. These last examples point to an essential aspect of harmony. Not just a matter of what happens, but also a matter of when. Something important changes in a significant way should happen in a moment when it makes sense, like the peak or the cadence of the phrase, or at the start of a new phrase. Otherwise, it just sounds arbitrary. Also, the preparation matters. To sum up, tonal really means some kind of auditory progression, creating expectations to get the listener involved. It does not necessarily require the beginning and the ending to have the same tonal center. Tonal coherence also requires significant changes to arrive at significant moments, and to have some kind of audible progression. They're not to sound like mistakes. Also, there are various degrees of tonality, 
range from classic harmonic tonality to situations where there is a sense of direction, but less obvious and at times even obscure. It isn't black and white. And a composer can use these various theories of tonality in meaningful ways. For example, Shostakovich's musical language sometimes even includes passages that are very dissonant and harmonically complex. But then, in the same work, there will sometimes be another passage that's straightforwardly tonal, in a really obvious way. See, for example, the endings of his 13th and 15th symphonies. The emotional effect of these very tonal codas is enormous, like finding peace after something terrible has happened. This is a wonderful aspect of Shostakovich's music. Combining harmonic languages like this in a way that makes sense makes it much more potent and expressive. Shostakovich didn't aim at throwing up musical tradition, he aimed at enriching it. For me, atonal just means music where the pitches sound random.